This is the Fantasy Ladder Podcast, episode 30. This podcast is brought to you by the IDP Guys Network. I'm your host, Steve, at Fantasy Ladder. So welcome back once again, my fantasy football friends and family. Let's climb the ladder of fantasy football together. So today we are going to be going through all of the matchups for week three of the NFL with a very special guest. I uh, did just want to remind you to subscribe to the IDP guys newsletter that will come into your mailbox or your inbox every Wednesday morning uh, with a lot of great information and links to articles on the site. So please check that out. And while you're here, if you, if you enjoy this uh, video and other content on the IDP guys, make sure you like and subscribe to the channel so you never miss new videos from the IDP guys network. So without further ado, we're going to bring on uh, this week's special guest. You know him on Twitter. He is at HooveTube. So welcome in, Hoove. Uh, how you doing? And why don't you tell the people about you? I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. What is up, love? It's your boy, Hoove, making his debut on IDP. So you know what? We're going to break it down. We're going to get to it. And uh, hi, Nate. Hi, Jen. I just want to say hi to my people, you know. Parking lot, get, parking lot people out there, Wolfgang forever, you know, Scott, you guys know, okay, shout out <laughs> people. I love it, I love it. Uh, yeah, so um, appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, we're just going to be going through a few little like warm-up questions, so just so our listening audience can get a little bit more familiar with you, uh, just like your likeness of, of football in general, and just a little bit more about your personality. So just for starters here, uh, let's hear your favorite NFL team and your favorite college team, if you have one. Well, my favorite NFL team is the San Francisco 49ers because all 49ers are legends, okay? And so there you go. <laughs> bang, bang, Niner gang. And then I am obviously from Wisconsin, so I'm not a Packer fan being from Wisconsin, but I am a huge Wisconsin Badgers uh, fan, whether it's basketball, football. I'm rock, I'm rocking that as my college for sure. So, you know, during basketball season, it's always a good time being a Badger fan, but during football season, it is rough. And it is only going to get rougher when they when UCLA and USC joins the Big Ten. But I don't want to talk about that. Okay, we can talk about pro football, not college football today. But I honestly, you can follow me at HoopTube on Twitter, or you guys can check me out on YouTube. But I stink. I would not. I would not take my advice. I know I'm on a fantasy show right now, but I am terrible. My fantasy team stinks. All of them. <laughs> So I would not listen to me. But you know what? We're going to have a good time tonight. And uh, you know what? It's what who's Steve breaking it down. How you doing? But, well, I mean, either way, uh, fun will be had for sure. And it's very interesting that you are a Wisconsin fan because I am a Penn State fan and alum. So we will still be able to have some peace tonight. Uh, I am confident in that. But so you should mention like, the, the, the fantasy football is a little bit brutal for you at, at this point. Uh, wh what's your favorite way to play fantasy football? You got you like redraft or dynasty, DFS, best ball. What's your uh, cup of tea there? Well, shout out Joey Wright because uh, I was just a redraft guy before this year. And okay. uh, he's got me in my first best ball league, which I am three and two. And that one's not terrible. I'm in with my fantasy leagues. I'm in nine of them right now. Almost nine. Three. Okay. Gotcha. And, uh, and so I'm in a few redrafts. I'm in a few dynasty and I'm in one best ball league and there's like either I'm set up really well. I stink. Right. Or I'm like, like two and two, three and two, you know, somewhere around there fighting. So, well, well, the good thing about dynasty is uh, if you're really bad, you can always say, Oh, I'm doing that on purpose so I can get a better draft pick next year, right? Like there, there's this concept of being a contender and being in a rebuild. So you always have that fallback excuse. Now in redraft doesn't always work that way because you're trying to win that season. So how, how are they now so much? Oh, yeah. I converted my home league into a dynasty league. And that one, I'm killing it, man. I converted Javante Williams into two first round picks. So and that guy. He's like has one win. So that's going to set me up for B. John Robinson right there. And I'm just, I have seven first wow. in the next two years with that squad with Brees Hall, Aaron Jones, and that backfield, Kenneth Walker, Brian Robinson. It's a young core and it just gets better and better. So Man. I'm so excited. I love Dynasty. Best ball, it helps me out a lot because I'm that dude that always benches like one guy. Like 
I'll start Boston Scott, and then all of a sudden, like, someone on my bench goes up. I don't know why Boston Scott. Maybe I just passed memories with Boston Scott. That's why I came to mind. Oh, yeah. But yeah. I'm that guy where, like, I'll start the wrong guy, and I end up losing because of it. But my roster, if you look at it, that's the winning team right there. Picking through. You know, um, th- th- there's been a couple instances here where the concept of best ball has just basically sold itself, right? Like two weeks ago, um, I was uh, joking w- w- with my guest um, uh, at Dave Fantasy from um, In Between Media. We were joking about like how brutal it was that Alvin Kamara was like a late inactive for that early morning like London game, like two Sundays ago. So there there's your sales pitch like if you slept in and you missed that that's never going to happen in best ball right um but or like but you should be awake let's be honest that's your fault as a football fan if you are not awake to watch the london games you're not a real fan i just have to say that i'll say that with my chest to every one of you yeah. fake ass fans out there that <laughs> i think it was like yeah i think fans. um I, I i would tend to agree although it's a little bit easier for me being on the East Coast, I think some of the West Coast people, even if they had a 6 a.m. wake up call, they still might not have been aware. I don't know. You know what exactly. I mean? So I, I I am sympathetic to 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 the West Coasters who may have missed that news if they were sleeping in there. But I agree. It's like you should you should never sleep. It's football season, right? That's right. <laughs> like I'm always 24-7 for a trade and 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 fantasy. Like I don't sleep. I'm always waiting for that next move. You know, I'm like Adam Schefter, you know, oh, yeah. I'm all the way 24 seven. Okay. No, but, but that, but that, that's what dynasty f- 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 fantasy will do to you. Like every month of the, of the calendar is still relevant for dynasty to a certain degree. You know what I mean? So um, that, that, that is why over the years I have become much more of, of like a dynasty uh, preference uh, player as well but um so so nine leagues i think that's that's a very healthy amount <laughs> um yeah, i need more <laughs> well so i i, I will say that I, i'm in 27 and all of them are lineup setting leagues so i'm not in any best balls this year um and i think next year i may need to cut back and then if i want to add more they're only going to have to be uh best balls because i just can't handle doing you know that the, 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 this many rounds of fab and waivers every two or however many days, and then change all the lineups. Like you, you got to make. I'm like sweating it out on like Thursday no. nights, like making sure I don't have anyone going like Thursday. So it it just gets like really insane. Um, but I do enjoy it. But I am kind of a sicko, you know, as far as like how many um you you, you play in. But it's almost as becoming too much. But I think nine is a is a very good amount. Um. So, like, what 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 typically is like your Sunday morning um, routine like? So, like, I'm one who will like typically will tinker throughout the week. But then again, if you're in so many dynasty leagues and you know, like, well, this one's rebuilding, I don't need to f- have as much attention paid to it. If this one I'm content, you might want to ha- look at at those things under a microscope a little bit more. What's your routine like on, on Sunday mornings, making these like last minute decisions? Well, I wake up in the morning around 8 a.m. and I go and shower. And I stress for about three and a half fucking hours because I, every decision that I make throughout the week, it just like, it comes to that, that crunch time. And I'm like panicking. I have every second, every second of doubt in my head. And I'm like, there's, yeah, I'm, I can't start this guy. And of course I will end up making the final move. I'm like, all right, I'll talk myself into it. And my instinct throughout the whole week was of course, right. Like I said, I'm the guy that always starts one wrong player, and it always comes down to second up. Always. Yep. I'm with you. Yeah, I, I've done that more than yeah. enough times already just this season, and it, I just feel, like, sick. Yeah, I just feel sick to my stomach when, like, you realize, like, just a horrible mistake you made. But, no, uh, there is definitely a lot of mania um, on, on my end there. Uh, around that 12.30 hour, you know, at least on the, like, a half an hour before the game start, the, the early round of games, I am just, like, Whew, just like taking deep breaths and, you know, just hoping, you know, I, I don't do the wrong thing, but that's usually is when I make the worst decisions is when like the clock is getting close and all the whole thing I thought of all week long just goes out the window, just not good process. But you know, in, in that moment, it seems like, well, this is probably the right thing to do, but yeah, the, 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 the last minute decisions will, will, will definitely kill you. Uh, yeah, for sure. Dylan. 
keep doing that to me. And like, honestly, like I talk myself into it every week. I'm like, I'm just here to get hurt at this point. So that's <laughs> cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, I mean, Godzilla. yeah, I, him and uh, just a few other players have just been complete, just disappointments. As far as I'm concerned, he he's definitely one that has not uh, lived up to, my expectations or just the general expectations of, of even like his, his draft cost, you know what I mean? Um, but either way, no, I'm with you there, but it is so tempting, isn't it? Like every single, every single week, like he, he should be due for a touchdown. He should be due for like hundred yards or whatever. Ah, it's not crazy. It's not the week, Nick. Crazy, crazy. Anyway. Okay. So we are here in mid October. We are starting to get into spooky season, right? Around your neighborhood, you got people with the spider webs in their bushes and, and all the scary crap all around. And we're going to be seeing pumpkins and all this too. So I am just curious, just to kind of dig into a little bit more about about your your personality here. Curious of a favorite or favorites? You can list however many. You, you feel you need to justify uh, naming here favorite scary such horror movies or uh, TV shows. I made a list. Okay, so there's three beautiful. So did like, I. <laughs> there's three okay. that had to be on this list. Okay, let's for see. sure. And I'm not a big like horror movie guy. Like I, I like I like thrillers. I like yeah. stuff that's gonna make you think about it a lot more. Like like you know like that's why number one, Silence of the Lambs, greatest thriller of all time. Perfect. Like, yep. The fact that there are people out there like that make you think. Like, yeah, like I bet, I bet there is someone that's like manipulating people, you know, into eating them. I bet, like, that's why I love that movie so much. Makes me think. I don't think very much. So, like, it made me think. <laughs> I like that. All right, number two, The Conjuring. I love, like, perfect. I'm yep. not a big act, like the Exorcist, like the original, just because it's like a little, like, ew, like a little too over the board like a little too much but the conjuring like whoo that got me like ooh, that one got me because like i totally believe in like all that all that shit you know me you know so i i i, I don't fuck with that i mean like i do but i don't like that's why number three we're gonna lead to that the shining okay i would totally do a ghost hunting and i would go to that hotel in colorado i, I used to know it by name and now I can't remember it because, of course, like we're I, we're live on air, and now I can't remember it. Even though I've the the, the the overlook, <laughs> no, something like that though. I it'll come to me. I, I promise it'll come to me, or someone's gonna put it in the comment section. I know it for a fact, <laughs> but it it's like it's iconic, and I totally would want to go there. So The Shining, you know. Oh, the real hotel. You mean I gotcha? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, what is it? Oh man, that's gonna kill me. Uh, I know. I know Stanley, in the movie, Stanley Hotel. Stanley. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, I would totally go to the Stanley Hotel on Halloween. You know, just like get some ghost equipment. Oh, that'd be so much fun. But you have to be, you have to be prepared. You have to be careful. You can't get anything attached to you. We're green, cool. All right. Uh, so that leads me up to my next one. Okay. Okay. This is a classic. You know, anyone that says they don't watch these, they're lying. They are so full of it. Halloween Town, Halloween Town series, always a classic. Okay. There we go. Like honestly, the the newer ones are good, but the originals are like so much better. And then uh we're going we're throwing it back big time. This one, like this one reminds me of my childhood, the Monster Squad. Have you ever seen the Monster Squad? I have not seen the Monster Squad. Oh, gotta Anyone write that one down. The Monster Squad, okay. You let me know because you're officially followed on Twitter. You are a homie of who? Because <laughs> anyone that knows the reference Wolfman has nards, you understand. Okay. It's basically a squad of Dracula, Frankenstein, the Wolfman, and like the mummy. Oh, and, perfect. Uh, okay. And it's like the main creatures and they come together and it's really good. I'm like, oh my gosh, that sounds I great. Like, yeah. And it's like old too. It's like 1960s, 70s. Oh, wow. So it was like the, the, the classic. Oh, wow. It's like the classic monsters, like Avengers. They all came together. <laughs> pretty, pretty much. And then they had to take on some kids. So pff, they should have wiped the floor with those kids. I'm just, I'm not going to lie. It's like some Stranger Things shit. Maybe that's where Stranger Things gets its idea from. That makes sense. But yeah, uh, it was kind of like the, the Goonies and Stranger Things. They kind of like 
for sure. The, the, the kid, the kids kind of took it over there, which sure. is awesome. Uh, I'm, a bit, I'm a big fan of that too. So that's we, awesome. We can't not talk about Ghostbusters, you know, even Absolutely. the new one. Like I honestly really like the new one just because it like wrapped everything up. Oh, yeah. okay. Gotcha. Really good. And then, uh, the sixth sense i see dead people come on that one's classic and of course we won't say his name three times but i'll say it once just for this list beetlejuice <laughs> absolutely oh that's great yeah no so so we definitely have a wide range of very seriously scary and then kind of fun spooky fun scary right so, so that's awesome i think that that covers it uh fairly well going through the, the, the list I have, we definitely have a lot of alignment here. Uh, I wasn't sure if I wanted to go with like, like a, like a one Oh one. And then like a, like an umbrella that like, just kind of like, well, this is what this one's at the top. I got a bunch I really like, or like a Mount Rushmore or whatever. So I just like wrote down a whole bunch. So we definitely align uh, to a certain degree. I wrote down, but the first thing I wrote down was, was, was the shining absolute classic. That's this is a movie still to this day. I can, I would prefer to watch during the day. <laughs> I don't like watching this movie at night. Really? I'm, I'm still, I'm like a little squeamish, but even though I've seen like a dozen times, prefer to watch it during the day. I'm just like a weirdo. I can't watch uh, it at night. I won't. It's that one messes uh, me up. The conjuring. Yeah. I won't watch that at night. I won't. I, I've only seen it once. It, it made my list. And I would agree that the, the impact that, that it had on me was immense. Um, extremely well done movie. Um, e even the sequel I thought was really good. It kind of like opened up like a lot more of those, um, like kind of like franchise, like single movie, like, uh, just like the single character movies, but oh my goodness, uh, absolutely terrifying. Uh, I also, <clears throat> as far as like the classic, like, like slashers, um, the original Halloween to me is is an absolute classic, uh, a nightmare on Elm street. I'm a big fan of the, the original there as well. Um, let's see, sort of a, more of a modern, like independent horror movie. Uh, the Babadook. Have you ever seen this? No. Okay. The so the Babadook, it's basically, there's like this troubled kid and he has this, uh, child's book. It's called the Babadook. It's about this, like, uh, spirit, if you will, that kind of like terrorizes this, well, this family. <laughs> and then basically the, the events of the book start happening like in real life. And it's just like this kid who's like a little bit troubled and it's like a single mom and they have to work through this whole struggle with this Babadook uh, character. But what's really weird about what, so it's like this, it looks like a man with like a, black top hat like an overcoat look, look, looking sort of a figure and it shows up in like semi different forms like throughout the movie but what's really freaky about this movie is that when i was younger i had a reoccurring nightmare that i would have on the same night of every year um from like the time i was maybe six until i was like 13 now in my dream uh what, what i imagined was this like man like tall figure, black top hat, overcoat that just like kind of slowly terrorizes like this town. And I would wake up that the way I would wake up was the same part of the dream. Every single time I was basically, was getting like eaten from my feet and like from, from, from my feet up. And then I would wake up like screaming basically. But this movie that the image of this, of this Babadook is literally what was in that dream of mine to a certain degree when I was younger. So like, the movie itself standalone yeah, is, is fantastic, that's cool. that's but, but there was this really odd, like uh, a connection to it that I had from that, from this reoccurring nightmare that I had for, for years and years, really weird. Um, so I, I definitely, you sharing that to viewers and I, that's awesome. I no, I mean, it, it's, it's such an interesting thing. You know, I, I, I just find dreams to be very fascinating in the, in the first place, but then to have, a, an actual like visualization of like what this thing like looked like on the big screen is like really freaky. Um, Steve went to bed. Steve went a little bit. Let's just say he will go to some nightmares and oh, I, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. One thousand percent. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone goes pee. That's cool. Oh, that's awesome. All right. Yeah. So, so that movie uh, freaked me out. Uh, I actually had the Blu-ray of it. I think it's great. I have to give a shout out to to uh, John Carpenter's The Thing. 
I am actually am a big fan of the original Exorcist, even though it is like a bit much. I think it's just a really well made yeah, movie. It is. It is. It, it's just it's so like if they did it now, everyone would bitch. But oh, they for sure, it so yeah. much better. They would they still like if they did it right with the right production, they could do it so much better. But like every time, like you want to do like a new Halloween, it's like the director always sucks, or the yeah. new Friday the Thirteenth. The director always sucks. So it's like you don't nail the original and everyone just says the original will always be better. So it's like you you, you have to nail it. Like if you're going to redo it, you have to nail it. And that's what everyone does in this generation is they just like rip off the old shit. Because the old Yeah. Because I think what, what I appreciate about some of the older movies is like there's just a lot more like practical effects rather than like special effects that obviously are really good when implemented well. But I think just sometimes like, like the practical effects – just kind of uh, look better, feel better. I don't know. Because uh, there was a remake of of uh, John Carpenter's The Thing, and it just doesn't... I mean, it's still like a great story, but it just, it just is not the same as the original okay. as far as I'm concerned. Uh, a couple more like modern uh, movies that, that, that I really like. Uh, there, there's Get Out, of course. Um, Hereditary. Have you seen Hereditary? Sounds familiar, but I don't know why the plot's not coming to mind. Fantastic movie. You, you just just check it out. Uh, I'll, that's all I'll say about that. Uh, last one I'll bring up. Uh, other than just me, gen in general, I, re- I like my, I like a lot of good like haunted house, like like Conjuring. I just I'm a big fan of haunted house stuff. But last thing I'll mention here is the Black Mirror episode called Playtest. Have you ever seen Black Mirror? Yeah, isn't that? Oh yeah, yeah. Isn't that really like, really messed up show? Like it, it's, it's everything up every episode. It's like a different plot. It's it's its own story. Yeah. It's so every yeah. episode is yeah. its own story. And a lot of the episodes basically revolve around one main theme of like how like technology is like leading like to man's downfall to a certain degree. Now Anthony in this Mackie's one, in it, isn't he? What's that? Anthony Mackie's in it. He he's in one of them, yeah. Oh, that's what I thought. Right. I think he's in uh, uh season four, perhaps, but um in this one, this guy um he's just kind of like traveling the world he's just kind of get, getting some jobs here and there just kind of just going all, all all over the place um he he lands in, in this one town meets this girl and she tells him about this opportunity uh where he can you know I mean, make a quick buck uh testing out a, a a video game now this video game is like a really immersive like um uh vr experience okay so in this game he basically is placed in in this like not, not like a haunted house, but it's just like this house. He's just complete. He's just there all, all alone. Now the game picks up and senses what you're afraid of, and then the more afraid you are in this game, it, it will amplify your own personal fears. So it just it just slowly builds up, and then just it just gets like really really scary uh, throughout. But that episode, I believe it's episode two of season three, called Play Test. Highly recommend people check that out if you want to watch uh, a, a scarier episode of uh, Black Mirror. But uh, yeah, so I definitely That's interesting. I might I might check it out. Yeah, so, so that obviously is just on uh, Netflix, I believe. So definitely something to check out if you are in the uh, mood for something scary or spooky. Take all that that who've said and take all that I've said. And I think you'll have yourself a pretty good uh, watch list there for sure. Now, we are going to bring it back to football because that is just like the purpose of the show. So we're just going to touch on some of the... Uh, Big takeaways of week five, the, the week that had uh, just ended here. Uh, some things that really stood out to me um, was, one, the the Giants absolutely stunning the Packers in London. I think at this point, um, Brian Dable has to be considered a coach of the year candidate at this point. It's really impressive for them to, to beat a really good Packers team with just really limited amount of, of offensive weapons Really, really impressive stuff. Um, I'll, I'll get to some other points here, but I want to hear who, uh, what some of your biggest uh, takeaways were from week five. All right, I got seven. All right, I made a list. Okay, let's do it. Number one, my fantasy team stinks. That's, that's number one. <laughs> um, number two, like these are all spot on. I hope you know. Okay. Number two, Brian Dable is good at coaching. He is there you go. Coaching. Number three. <laughs> Travis Kelsey is him. 
he is that dog. Number four, my fantasy team really stinks. I'm not like I wasn't joking about that. I just feel like I had to really, really put emphasize on that. They they are <laughs> dog shit right now. Number five, um, Devonte Adams is a big meanie head. I don't know why you had to do that. There's no reason to do that. You know, honestly, get. I hope that guy gets his back. Get get it, boy. Six, okay. Alec Pierce is made of gold. Okay, so. He's made of pure, oh, made of pure gold, not just gold. Made of pure <laughs> gold. Okay. And number seven, last but most certainly not least. Okay. And you guys can hold hold me to this because I'm feeling it. An injured 49ers team might rep the NFC with a lot of pretenders in that conference this year. You heard it here first. And that's there not me saying that as a 49ers fan. Last time. At the 49ers went to the Super Bowl. That was when I started putting out a little bit of content over on YouTube, and they were four and zero. And I looked at this this Niners roster, and I went, "This team could do it." And they ended up just keep winning and winning and winning and winning, and they ended up making it to the Super Bowl, losing to Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs. But I was right that they were the representatives. And I don't know. It just seems like teams like. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get hate for this, but the Eagles. I honestly think the Eagles are pretenders this year, and they are good right now. They're looking great. I'm gonna not gonna take that from them. Okay, they are, but they're not gonna. I don't think that they even make the NFC Championship. I think that when it comes down to playoffs, that they're just gonna get upset by Tom Brady and the Bucks, or just one of these like wild card teams that they're just gonna come in. The Eagles are probably gonna be the first seed in the NFC. They're end up and they're gonna end up losing in the first round. So. Like the 49ers slipping their way in there past the Vikings or the Packers, obviously, because we own the Packers. I mean, my mom owns the Packers, too, because she's a ticket holder, holder. But, you know, <laughs> but that's besides a different point. You know, like the 49ers, they totally could just slip past one of these teams with an easy upset. And, like, the Eagles next year with those first-round picks, that's when they're going to be serious contenders. I will take the Eagles give them everything next year because I know that that team's going to be special. But this year, I think that it's just a little too premature and that there's going to be another team that slips up and gives them extra motivation next year to actually go to the NFC Championship or Super Bowl for Philly. But, yeah, I, I mean, if the Eagle, that's another narrative people aren't talking about with the Eagles right now is that if they lose, if they lost one game, that would be a three-way tie for that whole division. So it's like they're not – they're not, yeah, they're dominant, but they're like, they're not that dominant on their division even. They're everyone's right behind them. So, yeah, the Eagles are obviously better than Cooper Rush and the Cowboys, and we'll talk about that. But yeah, I, I honestly think that. The okay. Are. But what about you? I, no, I I have zero issue with that. Uh, as an Eagles fan, I, I don't take any offense. Uh, it has been fun up to this point. Uh, I just always want to kind of keep my head above water. You know, I, I always want to keep myself right. grounded, if you will. I don't want to just stay floating in the sky. That that's never where I want to be as a fan. Um, but no, I mean, so far with who they with who they have played, that they have executed well. They just barely beat the Cardinals. You know what I mean? So yeah. um, it is they're just very great. interesting that they're good, team. good teams. Learn right. to win those games. That's why I'll give them credit. And like the Vikings, they're kind of like the same way where they're winning. Right. But they're barely winning. And, like, good teams win those matchups, but great teams just beat that ass. You know what I mean? Like the Bills. Now, well, but we, that's right. Yeah, yeah, No, no. Well, well, what I will say to your point about the 49ers being, um, you know, definitely a, a deep contender, well, well, what they have is, ex- like, that they have they have experience. So they have been there, right? So, um, you know. Jimmy G really good offensive weapons. Kyle Shanahan. He's had, he's had a number of deep playoff runs. Um, so it's not going to be very overwhelming basically for, for that whole team to enter into that situation where it might be a little bit more overwhelming for a team like the Eagles, even though they look phenomenal, but there is like that, that lack of experience that that comes in with that. Right. So like, like you can point to a million examples of where really great players, even having like MVP seasons will fall short in the playoffs just because they haven't been there yet. It just takes some time to, to get that footing and, and that confidence down. It makes a tremendous difference. Like Lamar Jack, seeds, you know, and that's a, that's a really good question to, to try to figure out at some point, but like the, uh, the, um, the, the Ravens with, 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 uh, Lamar Jackson and his MVP season, yeah. they, they got 
they got beat at home. I think like the Titans beat them or something, right? Like they, they got like stunned by, by a a lesser team simply because like Jackson just hadn't been to the postseason yet at that point, I don't believe. So it's just interesting. Like I just, just that experience really goes a long way. So that'll be a really interesting thing to keep it, keep an eye out on, but you just, it's just so funny. Like the NFC West, it's like, you just think, oh, well, 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 the Rams are just going to be, but they look like, garbage i mean they, they still have really good talent on the defensive side of the ball but like matt stafford yeah, just yeah, looks yeah. so he looks hard he looks really bad and it might be like like the defensive line or the yeah. offensive line isn't you know quite where it was or whatever but it, it really does not look great there no, in in la <laughs> yeah. but um i i definitely think that the the 49ers have if not um the most complete but definitely like a top five like complete roster from like top to bottom on, on, on defense and offense. They are. So we I'm with you there right now, but like when they come right. back, like playoffs will be around that time. I feel like we'll secure like a playoff spot and then we'll just rally. And For sure. We, here we go. Let's go. Bang, bang, That's very interesting. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, so, so we definitely see eye to eye on the uh, Brian Dable talking point. Uh, I just had to throw out there that my Eagles remain undefeated. So that that still is going to be a thing I'm going to say until it's not true. Um, unfortunately, Eagles what's that? Fly Eagles fly. That's right. That's right. Um, so unfortunately, Rashad Penny is out for the season, making the uh, early selected um, rookie running back uh, Kenneth Walker. Right. A very intriguing player moving forward, especially because of how decent like the Seahawks offenses look, which is like kind of like odd to say. I really didn't think that uh, Geno Smith was going to have quite the season he's having, but it's really fun. It's really great. Um, so as far as what's that? Shout out Geno Smith, but like, <laughs> come on, can that can, that can stop any day now? As a 49ers fan, as a Geno Smith fan, keep going, keep going. It, it, it really. It really kind of feels like, you know, Sam Darnold last year, you know, like he had the really hot start to the season. Like first five weeks, he was like quarterback five. You know what I mean? Here it I'm not... Carson Wentz. There you go. Yeah. So I I am uh, kind of skeptical of, of how it, it'll be uh, sustained. Right. But I think for Kenneth Walker's sake, I think for like the rest of season, I think he probably has like, like an RB2 ceiling and he's like a weekly starter probably a flex play for for a little while i mean through the bye weeks i think he could be be like an rb2 for 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 a lot of your fantasy teams uh but i'm very in, interested to see how he does but unfortunately uh rashad penny there is out for the season with the broken leg uh, i just want to touch on that the carolina panthers head coach matt rule was fired he's the first fired uh, head coach here in the first in, in his time with the team only having a, a record of 11 and 27 really not great <laughs> so um just a, a just a number of issues there uh in carolina but he he did uh get fired there after the uh brutal loss uh last week and then i just wanted to touch on just some of the rough in the passer calls that, that that have been made over the weekend first it was tom brady i thought that was one of the most egregious rough, um roughing the passer calls and then on monday night there was the one with like Derek carr i just i i just don't understand i mean i i get you want to protect players and stuff but this wasn't like hitting them low it wasn't like targeting their head uh it just they get thrown to the ground that's just what happens when you play football it, that just seemed like a normal football play to me uh from from from, from what, what, what i could tell i don't know it's just it's just really uh making the game just a little less fun to watch when like these calls can potentially swing the games. I mean, it didn't necessarily for the Raiders. I don't, I don't believe, but it definitely made a big difference in that Falcons and Buccaneers game. That was like late in the game. It was a third down and, and the Falcons were, were on their way coming back. But yeah, don't, don't, don't like to, to see that kind of stuff happen. I just think it's silly. I got three things. All right. Number one, if you don't start Kenneth Walker in your lineups going forward you're just asking yourself to lose. You know, I'm not the greatest person to take fantasy advice from. My team is stink. You know, I've said that how many times this episode, but, you know, <laughs> Kenneth Walker is about to get some volume. Let me tell you. You guys love the word volume. Draw Twitter, Twitterverse, whatever it is. You guys love the word volume. So, honestly, if you have Kenneth Walker, it is worth it. 
Because more than likely, there's someone in your flex spot, especially if you got like two flex, three flex leagues, and like two RBs, you more than likely have someone that's underproducing, and you could easily put Kenneth Walker. I think he's projected like 11.95 points right now, almost 12 points. Okay. I think he'll definitely beat that, especially this week, 15. Just with the volume alone. And I know people want to talk about like, oh, what's his name is the third stringer? Don't worry about it. Kenneth Walker has that dual ability. Yeah, people have... Knew that he was like the RB two out of the draft, but Brees Hall is that dog. You got to give it to Brees Hall. So, absolutely, Kenneth Walker is a start. Two, uh, Matt Rule. Matt Rule. They can use that as a scapegoat, but there's a lot more reasons why the Carolina Panthers are not good, and that's going to expose itself very, very quickly. Very, that's very right. Quickly. So, I think that there's a lot of things that there that were out of Matt Rule's hands, but he's not. He tries too hard to be a leader. And sometimes to be a leader, you just have to be a leader, not have these characteristics of a leader and get put in a leadership role. You just like have to like be that dude, you know, and he's just not. He has right. the characteristics of it, but he's just not. And uh, like having the quarterback rotation that they have, Baker and Darnold, I had a lot of high hopes with Baker, but I think that there was just way too many problems that, that were waiting for him in Carolina. And just everything and everything about Carolina right now just seems stale and bad. Even like DJ Moore shares seem stale and bad. Baker Mayfield's yeah. career seems stale and bad. Even like, yeah, Christian McCaffrey is keeping his game up, but like people are really talking about him getting traded out of there, you know, to finally have them yeah. rebuild. And like, I honestly thought Matt Corral was going to end up starting at some point this year. I really did. I thought that having two, two first round quarterbacks in that quarterback room, he was going to benefit the most and he was going to end up having like being the guy. No, of course he gets hurt, but that's, that's another thing that maybe they were grooming Matt Corral to be that guy over Baker and Sam and he just gets hurt, you know, right. That's out of Mac. That's out of, um, out of rules hands. So I, he's just a scapegoat. And then three, Chris Jones is 100% right. If you, it, they, they, they made pat, uh, pass interference, such a big thing the last few years and always reviewing it. They can start reviewing roughing the passer because that's just ridiculous what it's come down to. And Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. I get it. Like, like Tom Brady's saw, like he's old, you know, like when old people fall and they break their hip, you know, like that's a, that's a critical thing. So we can't have Tom falling and breaking his hip, but Derek Carr, Derek Carr is youthful. You know, he can get hit hard. You know, I, I watched this clip of Tom Brady at the start of his career versus now getting hit. Who that dude had his helmet blown off. So yeah, I think I think Tommy at this point at 44, 45, he he might need a little little protection. Let's just say, but you know, Derek Carr, he can take some hits. He's been get he hit like honestly, I'm pretty sure he has like the most sacks, like. Per quarterback in the league or something like that the last two years. I, I oh agree. wow! But he's up there. I know he's constantly getting sacked because that O line was just. Bleh. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I just want the I just want the officiating to be as neutral and consistent as possible, right? Like I want all the calls that Brady gets to get, you know, Carson Wentz gets or whoever you fill in the blank. You know what I mean? Like it, it just is really annoying just because it's Tom Brady. Like he gets like the call if he's older. That does not matter to me at all. It's like I like it. Really. If it's if it's a if it's a clean hit, it's a clean hit. Or if it's a bad play, it's a bad play. You know, I just want it called just the same, regardless. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just, it's just very frustrating. But yeah, I like it rigged in benefit of my players. That's what I like. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, a, a, anything that gives you the edge, right? To to make your your fantasy teams less uh, crappy. No, I'm just messing. <laughs> but yeah. Hey. That's right. And you know what? Now that we're talking about my crappy players, we should talk about some players that you should start over my crappy players. So I love that transition. That that's that's beautiful right there. Exactly. So yeah, so we are gonna start with the uh week six slate. Uh we are gonna go through here with Hoove uh, the Thursday night game, the Sunday night game, and the Monday night game, and then go through some listener start sick questions. But before we start, I just I did just want to mention the teams that have the bye week this week. That would be the Detroit Lions, the Houston Texans, the Las Vegas Raiders, and the Tennessee Titans. Obviously, if you play on ESPN or Sleeper or Yahoo, they will indicate that those teams are on bye. But that's why those players will not be talked about because they're not playing. 
So we will start with the Thursday night football matchup with the Washington Commanders at the Chicago Bears. Uh, so basically what we just want to go through are the players that we think are strong starts or weak starts and just kind of dig into the games uh, a little bit deeper here with Hoove. So uh, Commanders at Bears, I think uh, a couple players come to mind as far as players you definitely do need to start. I'd be starting uh, David Montgomery on the Bears side of the ball. Um, outside of him, it to me, it's just a lot of question marks. Um, one of the systems I, I use in, in, in that I used to use in my start set uh, articles uh, last season was like a trust if you must and bust uh, system. So outside of David Montgomery, when he's healthy, I'm trusting him. Justin Fields, Darnell Mooney, from what he's shown at this point of the season, uh, they would be if you must. And and this is Fields in, in a super flex league only, uh, as far as I'm concerned. You feel any differently for uh, the Bears players? I don't think you could pay me enough to honestly start someone on Thursday night. Like I really don't. Especially okay. this game. Oh, I got. I bought Amazon Prime for the first time. Okay, I was like, all right, I'm just gonna do it. I'm not. I'm not gonna go to the bar every week on Thursdays. <laughs> Just to watch this game, I'm gonna get it myself. You know, stay at home, be more low key. And uh, man, the, 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 I, this week and last week's football are not making me excited about paying $14.99 for Amazon Prime. I'll tell you that right now. No, it's brutal. Right yeah. So you couldn't pay me anyone to to play on Thursday night. I kind of, I might have to. I have Cole Komet in a few leagues. Ugh, don't get me started. But I also have Irv <laughs> Smith. You know, most of those shares. So it's either Irv Smith. Or versus Miami, I want to say. I want to say Miami. Um, yes, or, that's or correct. Komet. Yeah. Or Cole Komet. And I'm like, if I start Cole Komet, it's going to be that another dog shit game. Just, just playing zeros. So I don't even think I'd want to start Cole Komet unless you absolutely have to. So no. No Bears yeah. players. Don't do it. Like, no one. There's just no, there's nothing to do with that offense that makes me go. Okay, I want to I want to start that guy. Nothing, no Montgomery, no Herbert, nobody. It's just like for the spread, for example, for this game. Even Washington, like I love Brian Robinson. I'm not starting Brian Robinson. I'm not. Right. Give him time. He will end up like he already out targeted uh, Antonio Gibson last week. That's right. Yeah. So yeah, you do that. I love that guy. <laughs> so oh, excuse me, but um. Even with Washington, like I was a big Curtis Samuel fan going into the offseason. I had him as my sleeper uh, with Dynasty Dorks. And uh, just because of the value where you could get him, like he wasn't even getting drafted. And he ended up like probably winning your week, week one, week two. Um, oh, yeah. I don't even know if I want to start him just because like it just, um, the spread is plus minus 39 and a half. And I have it as the over, actually. I think that this is going to be like the first over. Like Thursday night in a few weeks because the Colts that Broncos game was awful. I was and I'm saying this game is going to be gay. This this game is going to be great. Dyslexia right there. I don't know what what that was, but no, you're good. <laughs> uh, but I think that it's going to be an over, and I have Chicago twenty seven twenty one beating Washington. Okay, so I got them as the over. So I think that there's you're going to have to justify on where where the scoring opportunities are. So obviously, like, yeah, David Montgomery might get a touchdown, but do you really want to use a, a roster spot on a Thursday night player when you know that it could just end up being a Cole Komet 8.5 day or Darnell Mooney finally has his redemption? You know, Washington, you kind of know, like, where it's going to go. And Brian Robinson might get a first touchdown, but you don't want your running back to, or your flex player to get eight points. Right. Go for that. Go for the juice. Go go for someone that's gonna give you like fifteen and really go for the kill in fantasy. So, yeah, with the 21-27 game on Thursday night football, there's no one you could interest me in to start. Yeah, so I think um, on the Washington side of the ball, I think Wentz could be used as like a super flex option, uh, just with the four teams on by. Uh, I think Wentz could could be justifiable as, as a as a super flex, but this is without uh, Jahan Dotson. He's already been ruled out without Logan Thomas. He's been ruled out. So therefore I would actually would feel comfortable starting uh, Terry McLaurin and likely Curtis Samuel outside of those two. I, I would feel very uh, squeamish to start any of the running backs 
unless I just like absolutely have to, you know, if I have like Derrick Henry and Josh Jacobs on a team and they're both on by or like Pierce or, you know, Swift or whatever, then like you just have to kind of hold your nose and, and put like, I, I would probably be more likely to want to start like JD McKissick over Gibson. I don't want anything to do with Antonio Gibson this week if I can avoid it. And then Brian Robinson Awesome. He was able to come into the game last week. Eight carries, 22 yards. I mean, it was it was just was already like a losing effort for 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 the commanders anyway. But I'm not remotely ready to start him yet um, in this week's uh, matchup. So I would tend to agree. A lot of players I'm avoiding in this matchup if I could help it. Although on the Bears side, I actually would feel comfortable with, with, with David Montgomery. I was very encouraged but by what he showed uh, last week uh, returning from the injury. Uh, but yeah, pretty slim pickings there. Uh, you made a good point like with with Curtis Samuel. I think that maybe is like a homer pick. If I had to, you can put my arm behind my back and twist it. Then I'd say I would start Curtis Samuel. But I just Thursday night players, they turn me off so much. That no, and, and I, I can't. I really can't blame anyone for just wanting to just completely fade this game. You know, um, I think, I think Samuel to me is more of like, of like an, if you must, which is basically like a deep league, um, like, like a deeper league, like flex options. You're not going to love it, you know, but that's the, that there, I can see where you could get him into your lineup. But I think, I think McLaren is probably as, steady of an option as possible, even though that still has not been great uh, uh, in large part because of uh, Carson Wentz uh, for sure overall. All right. Uh, so going on to the Sunday night football game, we got uh, my Philadelphia Eagles hosting the Dallas Cowboys in the game to decide who's in first place. Uh, I believe unless the giants uh, can, can win again uh, for, for the division. So um very interesting game. The, the Eagles offense has been fantastic up to this point, but so has the Dallas defense. So uh, what do you think is going to give here in, in Philadelphia on Sunday night? You're going to really like this one. I'm just okay. going to you You're going to really like this one. And I, it's going to kind of go against what I said earlier, but this is a statement game. And it's not even a statement game necessarily for the Eagles. It's a statement game for the Cowboys. And let me, let me explain why. Because this game – the Eagles are going to beat the Cowboys so bad that they are going to 100% determine that there is no quarterback controversy between Cooper Rush and Dak Prescott, and they are going to know that they're going to need the best quarterback out there that they have in Dak Prescott the rest of the year. I have – it is a over 42 spread. Uh, the Eagles are favored by five right now. So I have – the Eagles, I'll take the under, actually, surprisingly. Even though it's going to be a blowout, okay. I'll take the under, which I feel like a lot of people are going to miss out on. But I have 9-31. to 31. I honestly don't even think the Cowboys score. I think they just get put in the field goal range. There's going to be a lot of opportunities. I wouldn't start Zeke this week. That's my sit. Um, just the Eagles' defense, like, they've been firing, too. You can talk about the Cowboys, but, yeah, like, it's Micah Parsons and Trayvon Diggs is doing his thing, but that's because – He's not that good. So that's why they're favoriting him. And I think Devonta Smith could have a huge week. I would love to start Devonta Smith if you have him in your lineups. AJ Brown, I feel like he might get he might get uh he'll, Doubled do, and he'll stuff. do his thing. He'll do his thing. He'll get you some he'll get you what you want, but I don't think he's gonna have a big game. Devonta Smith could go for another 30 pointer. That would be cool. Um Miles Sanders, like ever since they got rid of Doug Peterson, it seems like or Nick Sirianni is really realizing that this is a one running back system and Miles Sanders is that dude. So that's why I really think that Miles Sanders has some appeal this week too, even though Michael Parsons is right there. I feel like he's just going to have like one or two good, good runs. Maybe get you like 60 yards, something like that touchdown. Um, so obviously if the Eagles are going to score 31 points, everyone's going to have a good day more than likely. And the Cowboys nine points. I would not want to start anyone like C.D. Lamb. I don't think it's going to be a big C.D. Lamb day. I'd probably sit him. No touchdowns. So you got some Eagles players, fire them up. You got some Cowboys players. This is going to be a rough week. This is going to be a rough week. Yeah, no, I, I obviously am very happy <laughs> with your score prediction there. I mean, man, th 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 that would be a really fun day for, for, for uh, Pennsylvania for sure if that's the result. Um, and, and it very well could be. It's at that? Philly. That's why that's, right. like, that's a big thing. If it was at Dallas, maybe things would be a little different. But the fact that they're going to have that home crowd just 
pouring on the Cowboys and Cooper Rush, it's done. I'm sorry. That that was a huge determining factor for me. Was the fact No, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the the Cowboys of late have been winning solely on their defense. Like they have not been like exploding with, with, with like points or anything. Like Cooper Rush has just been like there and not like screwing up. You know what I mean? But but, but their defense is what really determined that game against the Rams. You know, and and, and the last couple. So uh, no, I, I think that's a really good call. I am just in this state of just stubbornness where I can't bring myself to, to not start CD lamb. Um, but, but you're right. I, I think it, it is, it is appropriate to have like lower expectations in, in this matchup with them. Um, but I still would say to uh, throw him into your lineups and then I'm starting all my Eagles. So Jalen hurts, um, Miles Sanders, Dallas Goddard, AJ Brown, Devonta Smith. I'm starting them all. Uh, at least those big five um, on the Cowboys side. Uh, I, I would agree that, that that Zeke is a fade. Um, one, 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 one of my fades for last week, what was James Conner? He obviously didn't do much against the, I mean, he looked, he looked okay on, on some runs, but he did not have a, a, a very good result against the Eagles. He did get like, a, he did get a little bit banged up there. Um, so the Eagles are able to stop uh, the, the, the running game uh, except for the, uh, the, DeAndre Swift uh, who just absolutely like, tore them up in week one. But beside that, um, I think you're absolutely spot on in managing expectations for the Cowboys, but I would be thrilled with a 31 to nine uh, result there on Sunday night. And people are going to bet the over. I really do. Like, I feel like the main consensus is going to bet the over and that's where people are going to be like, the Cowboys couldn't even score one touchdown. Like Jerry Jones is going to leave at the, at like five minutes at the end of the fourth bet. (laughs) <laughs> like that that's my bet is you're gonna see Jerry Jones walking his ass out of his suite around like five minutes to the end of the game because he's like, I'm sick of this shit. I'm gonna die I'm, like I'm getting a ring. I like that. That's definitely a fun thing to to uh, watch for. I love that. I'm writing that down. Jerry Jones leaving five minutes left. I love that. Oh man, that that would be that'd be phenomenal. If I nail that, all right. I want I want something in return from Twitter, not from you. Yeah, no, I'm thinking. You have to make a prop bet on that because that just sounds like it's going to happen. <laughs> so bet your friends. You'd be like, hey, I heard this from who, and I think I'm going to bet this because honestly, help, it'll help you down the road. Yeah, I'll say uh, if you're watching on YouTube, leave a comment and say what Hoove gets if if that occurs. <laughs> if Jerry Jones leaves a five minutes left, leave it up to the comment section. Oh, you that's hilarious. Mama. <laughs> All right. So now we got Monday Night Football. We have another uh, Denver Broncos game. This time they're at the Los Angeles Chargers um, with a clash of the AFC West. Um, I'm really sick of of watching the Broncos in prime time. I know it's not like a, a, an original statement in, in any form, but it just has been just a really sad offense to have to watch. And it's Nathaniel Hack, and it's just been brutal to like basically watch him coach. You know, in these prime time games, basically on the Chargers side of the ball, I'm still confidently starting Justin Herbert, Mike Williams, obviously Austin Eckler, who has now had two back-to-back 30-plus games. Uh, so just a little bit of patience goes a long way with a guy like Eckler, who is your new RB1 uh, overall at this point, I believe. Um, he was two last year. That's right. That's right. Uh, now, Gerald Everett is a tight end. I would still feel comfortable starting. Just the tight end landscape is still kind of stinky, but he's someone who I would still, you know, he's catching passes from Justin Herbert and Keenan Allen is still not, um, he's most likely not going to be active. So I would feel comfortable with uh, Gerald Everett on the uh, Broncos side of the ball. I, I, Kind of like C.D. Lamb, I like can't help but not start like Cortland Sutton, you know. Um, but I think, <laughs> ew, it's... that one, that one. I'm sorry, that was just disgusting. Oh, I could, I do not want to have any Cortland Sutton tra- shares at all. At okay, all. you know, I okay. Thank you for bringing that up. I have a little rant. I wanted to get this off my chest, and this is a great platform to do it. Okay, let's hear it. You know, people want to give credit about like Russell Wilson being Pete Carroll being what created Russell Wilson to be what it is. But no, that's not it. What we need to give real credit to, and I'm not saying these players are bad by any means. I'm just saying that we need to give proper respect to the players. The Seattle 
the Seattle Seahawks wide receivers, they are the reason why Russell Wilson was so good. Mm. I'm not saying Cortland Sutton and Jerry Judy are bad. I'm saying that you can see it clear as day that those guys do not know their routes. It honestly looks like the Packers offense right now. And they have reason to not know their routes. You guys, Cortland Sutton's been in the league for a while. Jerry Judy had that injury. If he actually was like, I'm not saying he faked his injury. I'm saying last year when he was injured, if he was studying his playbook, he would know those routes. I know the offense might be a little different with Nathaniel Hackett, but you, when you have Russell Wilson as your quarterback, you study that playbook like it's the Bible, and you are a, you go to church every Sunday. Okay, that's how much you read that playbook, so you should know exactly where it's going to be. And I'm, I'm okay. So I and that like I'm not, I'm also saying like Nathaniel Hackett ain't shit, but I'm also saying like Pete Carroll has some to do, but it's more comes down to the Seahawks wide receiver room. Tyler Lockett is a great route runner, and he deserves more respect. Even though in fantasy, I can't stand him. I I, I can't stand him. <laughs> great player, though. <laughs> no, for sure. No, I mean, really, um, very rarely do you see a pair like like Wilson and Lockett just sync up the way that that, that they can, yeah. right? Uh, another one is like Aaron Rodgers and like Devontae Adams. Right. Rodgers just knows where to put the ball, and Adams knows exactly where it's going to be. It was very much like that with, 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 with Russ and, and with Lockett. Then, obviously, um, with like Metcalf, I mean, you just put the ball in his general direction. He's yeah. going to make a big play. So I, I think that's a very, very um, interesting point um, for a long time. I just was a very big fan of, of Russell Wilson in general. And then this year, Ooh, it's kind of made me, it's kind of making me like rethink like, well, what was like the key to his success? Because he just does not look remotely the same. You know, like I figure, well, you know, talent wise is Judy that and, and Sutton that much different than, than the duo of Metcalf and Lockett. I mean, maybe it's, it's a talent. Maybe it's maybe the issue isn't the talent. Maybe it's just like upstairs, you know, like, like you were pointing to. That's right. It's, the, it's like almost determination to the game. Like how much you want to give, like, cause it, it just seems like even though people want to give DK Metcalf like crap for being wild, You know, I feel like he's very, very determined about his athletics and actually wanting to go to the Olympics and track and field. And, like, these guys, they take their shit very seriously. I'm not saying Cortland Sutton and Jerry Judy don't. I'm just saying that we should give DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett a lot more credit because you can see it that when you put your craft, when you put work into your craft, it pays off on Sundays. And Russell Wilson looked God level when he was with them. And Oh, yeah. Not look like that right now, but Nathaniel Hackett not being a great head coach and him being the next after after rule is going to be a, more icing on the cake. But that's for a different day. That's for a different day. We can talk about that when when he actually gets fired. Gotcha, gotcha. And then the running back situation now is is a little bit rocky without Javante Williams. Second game now in this offense without Javante Williams. Um, Melvin Gordon, I believe, led the team in touches on the last Thursday night game. Go Badgers. Yeah, there, there you go. Perfect. Um, and they got Mike Boone and, and Latavius Murray. Uh, w- would you feel confident starting any one of those running backs in this Monday night game? Because yeah. you got to, who, 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 who do you like? You, you do, are you a, are you a, a Melvin Gordon guy? They're going to give Melvin Gordon the ball until he screws it up and then they're going to take it away. And then, but you, that's Melvin Gordon, you know, right. The moment he fumbles, you don't know when it's going to be. He could have three quarters, four quarters. He could actually have a non-fumble game, a mess up. No boo-boos, right. okay? He could have a 15, 20-point game, playing the whole game. You know, boom, right there. Or <laughs> it could be like the second drive, he fumbles, and you have negative one points because they pulled his ass and put Mike Boone in. So it really just comes down to how much you really believe in Melvin Gordon. And me – it depends on the situation that I was in because I love Melvin Gordon, you know, being from Wisconsin, but I really like Melvin Gordon. He was Chargers Melvin Gordon, but Broncos Melvin Gordon, that does not, ugh, I don't know how much I'd want of those shares. I don't think I have one share of Melvin Gordon, honest to God. Yeah, I, I have a couple, and in that league, um, 
Well, and then the one main one I'm thinking of, uh, I do have Josh Jacobs, so I may have no choice. And I have Damian Harris. So I may not have any choice but to start Melvin Gordon as my as my RB2 behind um, Aaron Jones. But, um, yeah, so I think, like, he kind of falls into that, like, if you must category, like, if you have other options, probably go that way. But you could do a lot worse depending on the team and, and the league format uh, for sure. So I would say I would still feel comfortable with Cortland Sutton to, to this point, just because, again, I'm, I'm stubborn like that. Uh, I think Judy is like an if you must and Gordon is an if you must. And I think Russell Wilson is honestly just becoming a borderline super flex at this point. Right. Just really not um, – you're, you're you can't just look at just like the name value at this point just when you're averaging under 15 fantasy points uh it's it's really not good so he's he's definitely is a is a borderline he's at the Matt uh, Ryan level honestly and it just it just makes me want to pull my hair out because I, I just don't it just makes no sense to me you know it's like here's a guy who who's mobile here's a guy who's got really good pass catching talent even KJ Hamler can't forget about him like I don't know why you know things aren't clicking it just drives me nuts but um yeah so so definitely a little squeamish on on the broncos offense there but i would still remain pretty confident in your core four there for the chargers you want to know uh, that would be great please all right well chargers are favored six and a half minus six okay. and a half. broncos plus six and a half and it is over 42 so for me Honestly, I I love Justin Herbert. Justin Herbert is my boy. I drafted Justin Herbert 101 over Josh Allen in like every league I had the opportunity because that's how much I believed in Justin Herbert. But you know, obviously oh, yeah. you know, things things happen. The offense isn't clicking. And I look like a little doofy right now. But um this game, I think the Chargers win. But I honestly had the Broncos covering. And I will give them the over. So I'll take Denver plus six and a half with the over. I got a score of 20 to 24. It's the Chargers have barely been hanging on these last few games. And it just seems like the Broncos defense, they're keeping the scores pretty low. Offense for the Chargers hasn't been firing. They don't have Keenan Allen. And I think everyone will get their their feeds with the Chargers offense. Austin Eckler will have a decent game. Mike Williams will have a decent game. I don't feel Gerald Everett this game. (laughs) Okay. So, okay. And maybe it's just because I started him last week and he didn't do anything 0.7 points for me. But no, right. I think this is going to be almost like a repeat. Like Mike Williams, big day. Austin Eckler, big day. They're going to get back to their core, um, their core right there. And uh, Herbert probably, I hope he just more than 15 because I have him in so many leagues. But more than likely, that's what I'm expecting like another 15, 16 pointer from him. But like most people are going to take the Chargers just beating on the Broncos with how they've been playing right now and how the Chargers could be playing. Or they're going to take the over regardless because it, this could be the game the Broncos just start making every catch, you know, and they start clicking. So I'll take the Broncos with the over instead of the Chargers with the over, but I'll still take the Chargers to win 2024. Gotcha. Gotcha. I like that. All right. Excellent. So we are now going to take on some uh, listener start sick questions. So uh, every Wednesday I throw it out there on Twitter uh, to see if anyone has any real pressing questions for, for, for their starter sits uh, quandaries. So appreciate everyone asking uh, regarding that. So if you did ask, you will get a shout out here. So, and some, and some advice on uh, who we believe you should start. So we have two that are kind of similar here that both involve AJ Dillon and Travis Etienne, uh, but then there's some parameters to fit into. So first off, at Folsom Cody, he asks PPR, AJ Dillon, Travis Etienne, or Tony Pollard. AJ Dillon is going up against the New York Jets. Travis Etienne is going up against the Colts. And Tony Pollard, of course, is going against the Philadelphia Eagles on Sunday night. You want to start? I will start. Um, I am actually leaning Tony Pollard here, I think, um, because Zeke will be stymied. I think Pollard will be used as as like a little sneaky pass catcher. I, I kind of like the upside that he has uh, against Philadelphia in the passing game compared to the other two. Where are you leaning here? Well, I have, I have a lot of shares of A.J. Dillon and of Travis Etienne. And so yep. from what I've been seeing, 
is that I honestly think AJ Dillon, Tony Pollard will fall into almost the same category. Is that their RB ones are going to have about nine, ten point games. Maybe Aaron Jones does a little bit more than Zeke does because obviously with Jets defense, the Jets defense has been doing okay. So I think they might hold that that running back core for a little bit. Um, Aaron Jones will probably give you like ten points, but I think AJ Dillon still gives you like that three to five range. Tony Pollard doing the same thing. So I think my answer obviously has to go to Travis Etienne. It seems like they've been slowly transitioning from James Robinson to Etienne. So in a, in a PPR league, it's like it could be an A.J. Dillon day, could be Tony Pollard day, but from what the research has been showing is that Travis Etienne is getting more of that volume. Back to that big word that we were talking about earlier, volume. Oh, for Travis sure. Was my answer. But I he was – he he was uh, my my backup here behind Pollard. I think Pollard just has demonstrated just the ability to make like very explosive plays. So you kind of are banking on one of those happening. But Etn really has been uh, showing out uh, very well as of late. Um, so definitely not a, a bad call there. Plus, we know uh, how next- Doug Peterson. You you as an Eagles fan, you know how Doug Peterson is. He loves his running backs. He loves using them. So I think that the fact that they had they drafted Travis Etienne in the first round, they're not going to waste it like the Falcons are wasting a first round pick in Kyle Pitts. Don't get me started on that. But I think that they're realizing that this has to be the guy. Like James Robinson is going to be good for like picking up those like those short gains, and then Travis Etienne can be like utilized in multiple multiple ways, having that relationship with Trevor Lawrence. So that's probably the key to unlocking that offense more. Jaguars aren't terrible. Yeah, no, you, you want to take as much pressure off of Lawrence as possible because there will still be a lot of passing volume uh, opportunity there. But what was really encouraging about ETN last last week was just how efficient he was as a runner, I believe, averaging seven yards per carry. Right. I think he had 71 yards on the ground on 10 carry. So you really love to see that. Um, and then again, if, if the running game is working well, takes a little pressure off of Lawrence and the defense has to respect the run game a little bit more opens things up for the pass catchers. But the Jaguars offense has been just a bit of a mess uh, the last two weeks. Um, last week, yeah. only scoring uh, six points against the Texans in the previous week, having a, a pretty rocky game against the Eagles in, in, in the wet and, 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 and in the rain. Um, but no, I, I think um, ETN would definitely be good. I just cannot roll with with AJ Dillon at this point, even though it's against the Jets or whatever. Um, I, I had the same thought process last week against the against the Giants. Like, oh well, the Packers will just steamroll them. Well, not necessarily, you know. And in that case, uh-huh. like AJ Dillon just didn't do much. He just hasn't done a whole lot this year anyway. Packers which is very. Okay. He's he's has just become a uh, very touchdown dependent, and you just don't want to have to rely on that unless you're seeing it week, week in and week out, which just aren't at this point. So I just think he is uh, someone that you can definitely don't need to consider, but between those two, then a very similar question uh, at JNG nine, 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 nine. Yeah. Four nines uh, pick two is for half PPR AJ Dillon. Once again, Travis ETN and Drake London, Again, Dylan is going up against the Jets, ETN, the Colts, Drake, London against the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, pick two, half PPR. For a lot of the reasons we just said above, I'm going ETN and Drake, London here. Do you feel any differently there? Uh, I'm just I'm sticking with Travis, ETN. I, especially Drake, London going up against the 49ers, like we just talked about it earlier in the episode. The 49ers are, are the rep- NFC representatives this year. Sleeper pick. Okay, so I would not want to trust Marcus Mariota to Drake London with that defense. Okay. So maybe it's Pitt's week. Whoo! Whoo! Ooh, that could be that would be nasty. Okay, please. Even if it's my against my team, I wouldn't care. I wouldn't care. It it's due. It needs to happen. Let it happen, Arthur Smith. You're next. You're yeah, Mariota. seriously. Cool division. Seriously. Don't give me heat on Kyle Pitts. Travis Etienne is my answer. Not Drake London, not AJ Dillon. Travis Etienne getting that volume. Next one. Well, well, so 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 this one is pick two. So you got to pick Etienne and then one of either London or AJ Dillon. All right, then I'll pick London. Just okay. Because, just because I don't, I don't. Maybe I'm I'm doing reverse psychology right now, and maybe I'm just gonna <laughs> like 
spice it up a little bit with AJ <laughs> Dillon. You know, put a little fire under his heater. You know, what I mean? there you go, there you go. I like that. <laughs> All right. Second question comes from at Chimichanga 44. He has a tight end question. Dalton Schultz or Irv Smith? Uh, for me, this is Irv Smith. Um, th- there was a blurb uh, from, from Roto World that that said that uh, Dalton Schultz did re-aggravate his PCL in his knee uh, in, <clears throat> in, in the contest against the Rams in week five. So uh, I think you can I mean, he, he may not even suit up. I mean, you're not going to want to. He hasn't been able to play, you know, a full game the last two games. Um, so Irv Smith, for me, uh, just, again, considering the landscape of tight ends, you could do a lot worse uh, with him and and the pretty steady volume uh, of targets that he's been getting. Um, I think that is a fairly easy one. Once you read the blurb about the re-aggravated knee, uh, are you in agreement there, Hoove? I think I'd rather start TJ Hawkinson than Dalton Schultz this week. He's not a buy, so <laughs> yeah, Irv Smith. Well, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Uh, third question comes from Pippo Matic. Uh, he needs to select two running backs, two wide receivers, and one flex from the following. Actually, we'll come back to that. He has a two-part question: tight end Kyle Pitts or Tyler Higby. So Kyle Pitts going up against your 49ers and then Higby is going up against the Panthers. Where are you leaning between those two? Yeah, I know where Higby. I would go. Higby. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Higby. Well, damn, that hurts. Smokey, if you're watching, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. Like that, that hurt me. And I thought of you the whole time I said it. Higby. Nope. Man, man, I got root for a Ram too. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's rough, isn't it? Uh, the, 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 this game just does a lot of crazy things to 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 your mental state. But no, I agree. I, I love Josh to death, but I cannot start Pitts at this point. It's got to be Higby. He's just getting way too much volume in that uh, passing game there. Uh, he's basically getting all the targets I thought Allen Robinson was going to get, but that's just another one where you just want to bang your head against the wall. So uh, second part of the question here uh, needs two running backs, two wide receivers, and one flex. He has Ramondre Stevenson, Dalvin Cook, Saquon Barkley. So those are the running backs. Wide receivers are Tyree Kill, Gabe Davis, Devonta Smith, Michael Gallup, and Marquise Brown. For me, with the running backs, I'm going with Dalvin Cook and Saquon Barkley. I think Stevenson is in a really good spot to have success this week. Um, I just would roll with, uh, cook and Barkley on the wide receiver side. Um, basically picking three of these, uh, for a flex. I'm not sure if I would flex Stevenson over the wide receivers, although maybe I got to think about this a little bit more. I think, uh, Marquise Brown is pretty much a must start. I would start Devonta Smith as you were, as you were saying in that other matchup. And then I would be leaning Gabe Davis over Tyree Kill only because of the Dolphins needing to start uh, Skylar Thompson, who was pretty brutal in his uh, in his starting debut last week. I think Although you, I think I think you nailed it, and I would do Delvin Cook and Saquon, and like with the wide receivers as well with Devonta and and Hollywood Brown. Those are your must starts. But I will actually defend Stevenson there. And I'll say if Tyreek yeah. doesn't go, or if like even if you have any skepticism that Tyreek isn't going to be 100, percent put Stevenson in because like the last two weeks he's been he's been red hot, so go for it. All right, because I yeah, love I think backs. I I will start five running backs if I have the if I have the players to do it, I'll do it. RBU baby all day, all day. No, yeah. So I. I really love Stevenson too. I'm not really even considering Damien Harris to be a factor in this because he did leave the game early last week with the hamstring. Right. So even if he is questionable all this week, the, the Patriots have nothing to gain by by giving him carries on on a hurt hamstring. So even if he is active, that that's not going to shy me away from Stevenson. But I think Gabe Davis probably just gets a little bit of, of an edge because the the wide receiver room in in Buffalo is a little bit banged up. I think I am Isaiah McKenzie is due back. Obviously Crowder is out with a broken ankle, yeah. and they're going up against the Chiefs, so that could just be an absolute barn burner. So I think I mean I'm not expecting another like 
180 two touchdown performance, but I think he has a much higher ceiling um, overall. But I think Stevenson would still be a solid option, even over Tyree Kill. Uh, I would agree with that. Is, is that when you look at who you want to put in your flex, look at who's been consistent. And like you can go off the appeal of like Gabe Davis giving you like 30 and go for it. But like yeah. 15 from Ramondre Stevenson will win you that league, you know? Like knowing that you're going to get 15 in that spot, I feel I can go to bed at night. I can actually sleep. And, you know, like I said, I don't sleep, you know, yeah. fantasy and, and everything, making trades. <laughs> but I'll actually sleep that night for sure. I'll be like, All right, good. I, I will say that that Gabe is definitely much more – um volatile right so he could he could give you 30 he'd give you six right, right. where we're stevenson from what he's shown in, in this increased role much more steadier much more uh predictable you know as far as, as a floor is concerned as well um so yeah no i'm with you there i, I really like that thinking so uh hopefully we can help our guy here uh start the right players um fourth question comes from at triathlete chef he asks um, a couple questions here, so we'll just take them bit by bit. Uh, quarterback, he's asking. Um, he, he basically has Russ Wilson against the Chargers as like just the staple of his lineup, but he's just asking if he wants to kind of shift off of him to either Zach Wilson against the Packers, Justin Fields on Thursday night against the Commanders. Daniel Jones against Baltimore or Kenny Pickett against uh, Tampa Bay. I'm assuming he would be using one of those guys as like a stream that they, he would just would kind of pick up like, you know, last minute if he doesn't want to start uh, Russ on Monday night, to be honest, I don't love a lot of those options. The only one I can sort of kind of get behind would be Zach Wilson. That's right. Um, That's right. So so I don't love it, but I would go with, with Zach Wilson over Fields, Daniel Jones, and Pickett. I'm just I'm kind of struggling if I would bench Russ for for Zach Wilson at this point. I'll do Where it. would you I'll go say, there? I'll say okay. I'll say yeah I'll say bench Russ cause, just because we know like there's only like potential for two touchdowns in that game. You really want you really want him just to throw two touchdowns in a 20 point game on Monday night football, right? Yeah. Monday night football. Cause that's going to, yeah. that's going to, that's going to come down your whole week. It's going to come down to Russ. Yeah. You want that. You don't want that. I, I typically cool? like having those yeah. anchors. I typically like having like those anchors to like seal the week, but I don't know. It's just not as solid as, as, as years past. Right. So I do yeah. I go for the game and just try to like, see what Zach Wilson does for you. And yeah. if you're wrong, you're wrong, you know, but at least, you know, like Zach Wilson has that many receivers, Corey Davis. He, that's been like his number one guy. Elijah Moore could be his day. Could be Garrett Wilson, you know, Brees Hall, obviously he's been tearing it up. You know, they're not going to run it with him the whole time. He has that, that pass catching ability too. Oh yeah. So, I honestly like with the pack way the Packers just got beat by the Giants. I honestly think the Jets could win this game, it, it, or very close. And okay. I still like Zach Wilson getting three touchdowns, like three over Russ's two more than likely. Yeah, I'll take it. Give me it. Or even if he does two, and like he just has like more yardage with having that many receivers, like to help him out. Sure, Brees Hall gets one rushing, one receiving. That's two right there. That, that feeds Brees Hall for the day. And Zach Wilson probably still ends up with more fantasy points than Russell Wilson. Because I know I know that uh, he is mobile, that, that that obviously is part of his game as well. And, and Russell Wilson has been in the past, but not as much this year. So I think even um, Zach Wilson has has a little bit more of a floor because of, of, of the rushing there. So, so I do like that a lot. I, I actually like that call. I'm going to circle Zach Wilson there. You know what I'll say? Uh, the yeah. Jets have figured out their offense more than the Broncos. So I'll pick Zach Wilson over the Broncos or Zach Wilson over go. Russell Wilson. That's how you should view it, is what quarterback knows his offense better. Zach Wilson missed four games, and he still un he still looks like he knows that offense better than Russell Wilson knows his. 
Yeah. Yeah. I believe he's been averaging um, 18 points per game in the last two for that he's been active. So yeah. And that's better than, than what, what um, Russ has shown. So absolutely. He also asks, uh, he needs a, a PPR for his flex. Sorry. PPR league. He needs a flex spot between George Pickens against Tampa Bay. Darnell Mooney on Thursday night against Washington or, you know, Benjamin against Seattle. So this one is interesting because if there is no James Connor, then I'm going, you know, Benjamin against Seattle, 1000%. Then my backup would be George Pickens. He has been averaging like eight targets a game since Pickett's been in, um, well, over the last three games. So even before that, and then uh, Darnell Mooney, I just really don't, want to start a lot of bears, right? So the Eno Benjamin factor is just completely surrounding around James Conner, if he's active or not. And you might so. not, you don't think, do you think he gets like the majority of the work either way? Yeah. I think that they're, even if James is good, they're going to coast it that because he's their obvious for RB one. So right. maybe like James Conner gets a five point day. And he plays, but you know Benjamin gets like a fifteen because he ends up getting most of the load. I I I would just because the Steelers play who this week? Uh, the um Tampa Bay. So it's a really tough defense. Yeah, see, I don't I don't trust Kenny Pickett going up against Tom Brady and and, and getting more than two touchdowns. <laughs> like maybe Deontay Johnson bounces back, but I don't see George Pickens mm-hmm. doing it this week. Not against that team, so I'll, I'll go Eno Benjamin just for the hope, just for the upside potential right there. But it's against Seattle, so like every running back who's or uh, the, the 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 Seahawks have been one of the worst teams. The Seahawks and, and the and the Lions, I believe, have been the two worst teams against running back. So very favorable right. for for Eno Benjamin cool. either way. So I think it's a very solid call. Now uh, he asks a DST question. Uh, he, he he is streaming at this point. Uh, just has kind of looking over some options. Uh, Washington against the Bears. He's also considering the Bears against Washington, the Browns against the Patriots, and the Saints against the Bengals. So for me, where I start here is just kind of like narrowing down the options. So I think the Saints have a lot of good talent on the defense in general. I just don't really want a defense going up against the Bengals so I can eliminate them. Uh, the Browns is interesting because the, the, the Patriots are gonna, most likely going to be rolling out the, the rookie uh, Zappy again. So he hasn't exactly been lighting the world on fire, but he's he just been the Lions 29-0. That's true. I think he scoring team, the Lions shut right. him out zero points. So I don't even know if I want to believe in that. Okay, but I'm just saying, like the 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 offense in general is not that scary to me because I think the Browns still have a very good uh, defensive unit. Um, but amongst these options, I actually think I like the Bears against the Commanders the best, and just trying to, you know, capitalize on some Carson Wentz uh, turnovers, um, even though. I don't really want to play the Bears defense. That's probably is the way I would go just going up against Carson Wentz. I think he probably has the best uh, turnover potential. That's a good way to look at it. Yeah, because I don't love the – like the reason why I don't want to start any Bears is because like they're they're winning, but they're not winning pretty. You know, they're just – Oh, right. They're just doing what they have to. And like that's not appealing for fantasy by, by any means. <laughs> and so – uh yeah, like I don't want to start. I don't want to get either Thursday night team, but when you look at it with Carson West, more than likely throwing a pick than Justin Fields, I think that that's a good bet. And that if you're going to get like, let's say they all score 20, 24 points each game, or more than likely the Saints will probably end up, the Bengals will end up scoring like almost 30, so they'll probably like get less points. The fact that it's going to be somewhat of a low scoring game and you get like maybe an interception or like a fumble. Like maybe Antonio Gibson fumbles it, you know, and then they end up giving it to Brian Robinson the rest of the game. Um, like right there, that's points, you know, that you're probably gonna end up getting more than like a Saints versus Bengals or what was the other one? Browns Patriots. Oh, Browns Patriots. I don't know. That one just I, I don't. It's not even an answer for me, really. Um, 
yeah, I guess I'd probably go Bears just because. Yeah. Like, they were, yeah, they were holding their own versus the Vikings. Like, I'll give them that. Vikings are just a good team, so they just figured out how to win that game. Well, yeah, right. Yeah, I think um, the Saints definitely have, like, sack potential against, against like, the, the, the Bengals and Joe Burrow, but – that that's basically I mean, I just think the amount of points that, that the Bengals can potentially put up week in and week out might not be worth uh trying to aim for the uh, sack upside there. Right. Um so yeah, it's kind of it's kind of yucky, but I think we both are in agreement. It's it's the Bears against the commanders on Thursday night at home, by the way. So that that can help uh mm-hmm. for sure. Now, our fifth and final question uh, comes from a, a longtime uh, follower of mine at Jamie underscore FF addict. Uh, if you've been following along the show since the beginning in episode one, I actually talked about Jamie. Uh, he was a big inspiration uh, for me to start this podcast because it's been very um, rewarding to help people out uh, w- w- with making these uh, decisions. Jamie, of course, was the one who made me the t-shirt with my logo on it. So oh. just, just wanted to give special shout out to Jamie again. He, he's a good dude who is killing it in his leagues. Uh, not because of me, but just from, from, from other people. And he has been uh, picking this stuff up extremely well for himself. So I just want to give a special shout out to Jamie once again there. He has a couple of great questions uh, that we can discuss here. First one is pick two. He's looking at Garrett Wilson, Romeo Dubes, and Alec Pierce, Wilson is going up against Green Bay Packers. Dubes is going up against the New York Jets. Uh, um, and then Alec Pierce is going up against Jacksonville. He did not specify if it's PPR or not. I will just assume that it is because that has become more of the default these days. Who do you like between the three of these? Uh, Alec Pierce by a mile. That I literally... This, this one was not that complicated for me. I, I gave him like the check like almost right away. Um, so so tell me what you like about uh, Alec Pierce. Alec Pierce is the next generation of Jordy Nelson. That I is my that. gem of the draft. Like I honestly thought Alec Pierce would have been offensive rookie of the year if it wasn't for the fact that he was out like the first two games and the Matt Ryan just not. If Matt Ryan was peak Matt Ryan, <laughs> Alec Pierce would seriously be like. Everyone thought I was crazy for not believing in Michael Pittman. I'm like, Alec Pierce is going to take up so many of those targets. He's so good. He is. Yeah. He's he's so worth it. And the fact that they got him in the second round, second round, yeah, yep. I wanted him so badly, like to go to, like, I could have seen him go to the Packers or you know the Bears or like just team like a team that he would have just been this generational talent and like. I like the Colts. I got family from Indiana, so that's like my that's my AFC representative in a sense. Oh, so gotcha. like, I would totally <laughs> buy an Alec Pierce jersey. I love Alec Pierce. That dude's a monster. Cincinnati yeah, air catch baby. Oh yeah, no, I love it. Yeah, um, Wilson just kind of has tailed off a bit um, for 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 the Jets since Zach Wilson. Garrett Wilson has tailed off since Zach Wilson has been the quarterback. So he's just kind of iffy for me. Uh, and then Dubes in in Green Bay, he has become just a little bit of a touchdown dependent kind of a wide receiver, uh, getting like inconsistent targets and overall yardage. But Alec Pierce last couple of weeks has been averaging, I think, um, eight targets a game or, or six catches a game. I mean, he's just his he's been tremendously productive. Um, and if points. that's right, yeah. So so especially for for PPR. He definitely seems like the safest and the best bet here uh, between those three. So I would just roll with with like the hot hand here, if you will. Um, I think Michael Pittman is still going to get his um, that 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 running game really could be in shambles if if Naeem Hines isn't able to play and if Jonathan Taylor isn't able to play. Um, So they may just be passing like a ton. So, so, so you love that for volume and you love how he has produced the last two weeks. Um, So I'm with you. I, I'm all about Alec Pierce um, in, in one of my early videos for the IDP guys uh, YouTube channel here. Uh, I did a rookie mock draft and and one of my um, selections in that draft was Alec Pierce. I believe I got him in the fourth round. This was like right after the comp. It was after the NFL combine. So it wasn't like in the heart of rookie draft season just yet. It's still kind of early in the process, but I really liked him as like a faster version of like Eric Decker Um, coming out of Cincinnati. Not quite as productive as Eric Decker, but very similar weight 
and size, uh, but just a faster 40 time, a much faster 40 time. So when he went in the second round, I'm like, oh, well, I guess my comp still kind of lives a, l- a little bit. And then it's just been great to see him emerge in, in the uh, Indianapolis uh, offense. So, yeah, I'm with you there. That's awesome. Uh, I do like the comp of of uh, Jordy Nelson. That that is really really intriguing to me. Uh, that really uh, made me raise an eyebrow. So I like that a lot. It's just his footwork. Like and when you watch his clips at Cincinnati, that just looks like mm. Jordy at Kansas. That does. It does. Like I don't know, or Kansas State. Is Kansas State Jordy is from? I think it was Kansas State. I'm not sure off the top of my head. <laughs> I want to say Kansas State, but uh, yeah, like. Just watching Jordy's best highlights and just like some of those toe taps, that was Jordy. That was Alec Pierce, and I'm like, this dude's awesome. This dude is a freak. Like, I I love Christian Watson going into this draft, but Alec Pierce mm. took all of all of his momentum from me. I had just had my eyes just peeled on this kid. I'm like, he's gonna be so good. But yeah, oh, no, yeah, definitely. Like he was a big riser in in like like. In like the rookie draft season, you know, he could have easily, you could have, if you like did your rookie draft, like, like sicko ish early, like in, in the process there, I mean, you would have gotten an absolute steal, but then he kind of creeped up into like the third round, like maybe late second round in some instances. Uh, but yeah, so I'm, I'm really excited for him as well and would start him. I have him in eight out of my nine leagues. And if it wasn't for my arch nemesis, <laughs> Duffy Smalls, I'd have him in nine, but because oh, there I- you go. Because I think Justin Jefferson, she decided to take Alex Pierce. But you know what? I'll get her back for it. I think I played her this week. So that's there you cool. go. That's cool. Would have been a perfect nine. It wasn't for her. So dumb. There you go. Well, I guess you could always try to trade unless that's the best ball. Is that the best has, ball one? She has nobody that I'd want to trade trade for, I'll be honest. And I, <laughs> there you I, go. I'm going to share this with her too. Let her know. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have to check in on that. See, see if if you get Alec Pierce off of her, you got to let me know because that will be awesome if you get all nine. All right. Uh, so Jamie also asks uh, a question about James Robinson with Travis Etienne heating up. Like, what are we doing with him? Um, for me, he he just kind of goes back to being like a flex option. Just until we see more production out of him, more consistent work out of him. But with Travis Etienne coming up here, um, I don't know if you can trust him any more than as a flex option where even appropriate. You know, he's, he's kind of borderline flex option at best. Do you, do you have any th- differing thoughts on, on James Robinson there? Uh, I think I'm going to go with both of them being in my flex right now. I, okay. I drafted Travis Etienne to be like RB, RB1, RB2 in some leagues, but I also <laughs> drafted Damian Pierce in those leagues yeah. as reassurance. And uh, also having Brian Robinson deep in those leagues as well. I feel pretty good about that. Um, like, I knowing knowing Travis Etienne's upside and what he could be, I also, like, made sure I had reassurance for it. So, like, it's not going to hurt me as bad as it could have for other people that, like, went, like, Travis Etienne, Cam Akers. Like, those guys are down bad. bad. Oh, yeah. But, um, like, if you have the opportunity to put either James Robinson or – Travis ET on your flex right now, I would do that, but I don't think I'm ready to put them in like RB2 yet or Travis ETN more than likely. I James Robinson, the first few weeks, yeah, he could have been your RB2, but now it's coming to a point where they're realizing the Travis ETN is that dude. And the more you have James Robinson, the higher up in your lineup, the more disappointed you're going to be. Just, just letting you know. I'm with you there. Yeah, I, um, it's getting harder and harder to get him in, in into lineups um, in, in the leagues I have him in. So, you know, it had to be a really deep league and like multi flex spots. Like that's, that's really is where I'd be more comfortable with them. But the Jacksonville offense looked really strong the first three weeks. And then the last two weeks that they've kind of fell off a little bit. So again, if Lawrence can pick things up and they get into better, uh, like more neutral, like, um, um, Game scripts and stuff. I think that would help uh, James Robinson a bit, but at this point, nothing more than a flex uh, option. But definitely a good question there from Jamie. Last one he asks is how long before uh, we can start uh, Brian Robinson as like a regular in, in our lineups? Like, what would you need to see from Brian Robinson before you could trust him as a as a weekly starter? I would say it comes down to this week. 
because he's already – well, I, I wouldn't start him this week just because it's Thursday night. And he's right. only had one game under his belt. So if he can go back-to-back weeks, I think I honestly think that the fact that Brian Robinson is out – has a lot to do with why the commanders aren't good. And yeah, mm. they, yeah, Ron Rivera can blame Carson Wentz, but he's just a scapegoat for bad organizations to blame all their problems on. The commanders are a bad organization. I don't even know if Ron Rivera is that great of a coach. Uh, that's that's a side note. But I think that the commanders just genuinely knew that their best running back that they had was out. And so like they didn't feel whole in the offense. So I think that Brian Robinson coming back and really do a lot for the commander's offense and open things up. So if he can go back to back weeks of holding the volume, I'll know in my mind that 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 was their guy 100%. Everything that was reported about Antonio Gibson going to punt and kick returns, that Brian Robinson was going to be their RB1 going into the season. So then I'll feel more confident after after this week. Do I, do, would I start him week seven? It really came down to how much he produced this week. Because I think yeah. he, he got like six points last week. With just eight touches? I think he had just uh, 22 yards. I don't think he had any catches. So that would have been like 2.2 uh, in 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 uh in like decimal scoring. But he still out-touched Tony Gibson. So like that's – that was sure. big to me. That was big to me. And if he can convert that into points, let's say he gets 10 this week. That's not huge appeal in fantasy, but that's a start. That's a start of what he can do. After just playing two games in the NFL, he's already got ten points. Took a few weeks for Damian Harris to heat up, or Damian Pierce to heat to heat up. So that's right. Yeah, yeah I think the same thing's gonna happen with Brian Robinson by week eight, week nine. I feel one hundred percent confident. Yeah, I think I think you're. I definitely think it'll be a couple of weeks for me. I would want to see very consistent um, and more heavy uh, volume in, in the running game. So all we heard in, you know, training camp was like, you know, he's going to be a starter. He's going to be working between you know, the tackles and all this goal line work. And then Gibson is going to be, you know, like relegated to like punt returns and things like this. So if that does happen and that's happening consistently, and I think tomorrow, or I think on Thursday night will be a, a really good start to see how this plays out a little bit from further here. Um, if he's getting, you know, 15 carries a game, uh, 13, 17 total touches, if he's getting some passing work, if he's getting that week in and week out and the, you know, and Carson Wentz can like limit his like turnovers and stuff. I think that's to me is when he'll be a, a viable starting option. Uh, so it could be two, three weeks from now. Uh, it could be as early as next week. You know, if we, if I see enough from him on Thursday night, um, and, and Gibson is just completely like out of the game plan, then that would give me a lot more confidence. So I do think like each week that he gets back into the swing of things, I mean, I, I still even think it's a miracle. He was even able to be active last week. It's just tremendous, you know, yeah. uh, just really happy for him just on a human level. Um, but I think as, as a viable fantasy option, I want to see around 13 to 17 touches consistently either on the ground or, or through the air, like, like a mix uh, before I would feel comfortable. Um, but again, you know, if he's getting around like 10 touches a game uh, when we're like really heavy into the bye weeks, that, that still isn't bad, but just the commander's offense and running game in general just has not been very good. Um, Gibson has been very touchdown dependent, um, has had some games where he's catching passes and JD McKissick is catching passes too. Um, so it's just, I don't know. He's going to, he kind of seems like a, he'll be a little bit of a touchdown dependent option just because that's how the running game has been there in Washington, but I do think a couple of weeks is, uh, is what I'm, uh, is what I'm going to want to hold out to see first, uh, before I'm consistently. Maybe I'm just reading into Ron Rivera's disrespect to Carson Wentz, but like, let's compare Carson Wentz to one of my favorites, Jimmy Garoppolo. Okay. Mm-hmm. Jimmy, both are very known to just end up spoiling a game with an interception. If you're worried, what do like, like Kyle Shanahan does, if Ron Rivera is a good coach, like he claims he is and people think he is, it's like Kyle Shanahan knows that it late in the game, don't have Jimmy throwing passes, keep running the ball. And so like, I think that that maybe that's me reading into Ron Rivera's statement about mm. Carson Wentz being the problem, why the commanders can't, they do anything. 
maybe then if you're worried about Carson Wentz doing a late game turnover and costing you the game, then you really depend on your running backs. And if Brian Robinson's that dude, that means that they're going to really be depending more on Brian Robinson. So, yeah, I think he's the missing piece to that offense. And in a few weeks, it's really going to show. Really going to show. I like that. Yeah. Um, he knows him many men by 50 cent. That dude is a legend already. <laughs> already. Yeah. No, it, it was a really cool moment. Um, just, again, I just can't believe he was even able to play. You know, I knew he was practicing and yeah. stuff, but it's like, man, you really love to see that. But I do think about the, the Ron Rivera quote. Um when when you look over the division, I don't think like Carson Wentz is like light years worse than Daniel Jones or Cooper Rush. I think it just comes down to to their defense, like not executing. Like that was supposed to be a very good defensive unit. I mean, and Chase Young is is still out. So for me, the Cowboys defense has been phenomenal. The Giants defense has been surprisingly phenomenal. And the Eagles defense has also been very strong. So I think it's the commander's defense. It's not all on Carson Wentz, even though there have been some spots where it kind of came down to him, you know, kind of blowing the game you know, at the end or whatever. But I think the larger problem is, is, is the defense, but um, you're right. Just it's easy Maybe to Ron make. Maybe Rivera goes back to Carolina. Maybe he gets fired this season and goes back to Carolina. <laughs> Has a little homecoming, yeah. That'd be something. That, that, would, that would be interesting for sure. Okay, so that wraps up the the uh, the listener start sick question. So again, I thank everyone for participating and asking. Again, every Wednesday, I'll put that tweet out. So if you have any pressing needs, just don't hesitate to reach out, and we'll give you a shout out on the show. Uh, but who this was awesome. I I appreciate you coming on the show, buddy. Um, Please remind everyone where they can find you uh, and your and your uh, upcoming content. All righty. Well, you guys can go ahead and check me out at HoofTube. It's HoofTube on YouTube or at HoofTube on Twitter, Instagram. You probably can find me. All right. If you see a very handsome person in my profile on Twitter, that is Sven. But right next to him is your boy Hoof. <laughs> so go ahead and uh, give me a follow. Give me a subscribe on YouTube. Because it's your boy Hoof. I love it. All right, buddy. Uh, I'll see you in those in the in the in the Twitter uh, in the Twitter streets. All right. Um, and, uh, and and don't be a stranger. And best of luck to your teams. Hopefully things can turn around for you. And hopefully you get that last share of Alec Pierce. <laughs> I doubt it. I doubt it. We'll see. All right. Peace All right, buddy. Have a good one. Thank you Thanks for, for coming on. Well. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Take it easy. All right, so we are going to now finish off the Sunday slate. Uh, we went through the primetime games. We are now going to go through uh, the, er the early slate of games first and then the later slate of games on Sunday uh, using the trust if you must and bust system, uh, which really essentially is for, for players, I want to say, that you can trust. These are... Uh, players that you're starting in every single league in every format, um, just players you just do not want to uh, miss out on. Uh, if you must, it's kind of it's kind of interesting. So so this could mean it, it's a weak start, uh, a player who is good enough to be a starter but faces a tough matchup or holds an unclear opportunity in a good offense. So the good offense element does make a big difference there. Um, Although some caution uh, should be used while risk is recognized, this is often league format dependent, okay? If you play in a shallow league, I would lean towards benching. Uh, granted, you have a decent replacement option. In a deep league, I would lean towards starting since the options may be more scarce. Either way, ex expectations should be managed. Now, now uh, the players that I'm going to qualify as a bust, these are guys you want to keep on your bench, at least for now. They should be avoided since stronger options at their relative positions should be considered first. These are players that fit into uh, one of the following categories a player in a tough matchup or currently holds ambiguous weekly opportunity in the offense um, or a strong bench stash for season long purposes, but certainly in a wait and see period uh, wait and see if their role expands for starter caliber consideration. For example, this type of player may be a strong backup running back behind a stud in an elite offense, or could be in line for a big workload. If the starter misses time, like Alexander Madison, for example. Don't really want to start him if you don't have to, but it's just a lottery ticket uh, at this time. Or 
Another factor could be uh, currently lacking a clear offensive opportunity in either a projected good or bad offense, or four is too volatile on a week-to-week basis. There is no need to play boom or bust type players if you can help it. Um, We're kind of getting into the bye weeks where you may want to kind of take some chances, especially you've got some injuries and and some bye weeks here. Um, But really, players like this is just best to avoid, but still fine to have on your bench. So going to go through that system with these games, starting with the San Francisco 49ers at the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, for me, Jimmy Garoppolo is a super flex uh, play, uh, Debo. So he, you can trust him as a super flex, but anything, as a, in a QB one or in a one QB league, uh, definitely looking elsewhere. Debo Samuel, you trust him in all your leagues. Uh, Brandon Ayuk, he's an if you must for me. George Kittle is a trust. It just, it just would be devastating for him to have a monster game with him on your bench. You just start guys in good offenses that have as much talent as George Kittle. Just don't worry about the ups and downs. Just, just ride it out. That, that's what I would do. And then Jeff Wilson, uh, he is a trust as well against the Falcons. There should be plenty of opportunity for him to get some good volume here. On the Falcons side of the ball, the only two players I'm remotely interested in starting are Drake London and Kyle Pitts. Both of them, of course, will come in as if you must options. Um, Definitely in a good position to get passing volume, but the Falcons as of late have just been running the ball like crazy. Uh, still don't want to start Marcus Mariota as a super flex option though, but we'll ride ride with Drake London and Kyle Pitts as an if you must uh, factor. Patriots at Browns. We talked about, about some of these players already, but really the only two Patriots players I really am going to be trusting at this point is Ramondre Stevenson and Jacoby Myers. Um, you don't. You just don't know. You know which wide receiver it's going to be between De, uh, Devontae Parker, Kendrick Bourne, Nelson Aguilar, even Tyquan Thornton is coming back now uh, from from IR. So I'm just kind of steering clear on some of those guys uh, on the Patriots. On the Browns, uh, you trust Nick Chubb, Kareem Hunt, David Njoku, and Amari Cooper. Um, Jacoby Brissett, I think, is a super flex play here. Definitely tempered expectations. The Patriots are just a really stout defense. Um, so just kind of temper expectations there. But uh, definitely those core four I would roll with. And then uh, the New York Jets at the Green Bay Packers. So Brees Hall, just really hot right now. Definitely trust in him as a running back. Uh Zach Wilson is he's he, he's a super flex option, but more of an if you must here. Like if you have a couple players out on the bye weeks, uh, again that to, to remind you of the bye weeks, the Detroit Lions, Houston Texans, Las Vegas Raiders, and Tennessee Titans. So definitely opportunity to uh, be missing a starter uh, in the quarterback spot there. Uh, so Zach Wilson definitely is an if you must super flex. Garrett Wilson. Michael Carter and Tyler Conklin are are all if you must options. Garrett Wilson, obviously, uh, wide receiver. Michael Carter, backup running back, and Tyler Conklin, the starting tight end, uh, are if you must. Then Elijah Moore, big fan of this guy, but at this point he is a bust. Definitely want him on my team, but definitely not ready to start him against the Packers. Uh, the Packers, uh, Aaron Rodgers and Aaron Jones, I am trusting here. And then if you must for the rest. So um, AJ Dillon, if you must, Romeo Dubes, if you must, Robert Tanyan, if you must, really don't feel great about starting them, um, if I can help it. Jaguars at Colts. I think the Jaguars really the only player I'm like supremely, supremely confident in is Christian Kirk, who has had a couple of rough weeks here uh, in the pe- uh, in the last two weeks. Um, fine with him as a starting option. Then the rest of the Jags are are um, if you must option. So Trevor Lawrence is is an iffy super flex option. Um, Evan Ingram is an iffy tight end option. James Robinson, Travis Etienne iffy options against the Colts with the Colts trusting Michael Pittman. If Jonathan Taylor suits up, 
you're not <laughs> you're not not starting Jonathan Taylor. So you start Jonathan Taylor if he's healthy. And then Alec Pierce, as we said before, uh, we we're pretty excited for him. But he does come in as an if you must, uh, just because there are a lot of uh, usable wide receivers, as there typically are. He would be another guy I'm interested in. Uh, but like Matt Ryan is is kind of a borderline super flex uh, at this point. He just has been a little bit poor here. So I, I wouldn't mind just benching him uh, for sure. Buccaneers at Steelers. Uh, Steelers for me, just pretty much all of them are going to be an if you must uh, to the bust side. Uh, the players I do feel probably the most confident in as an if you must would be Deontay Johnson, George Pickens, and Najee Harris. Uh, and Pat Fryermuth. If, if Pat Fryermuth is healthy, uh, he's he's definitely a trust. He he just has been questionable, so keep an eye out for him. Uh, Buccaneers uh, core four here: Tom Brady, Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, and Leonard Fournette. They are all trust. Uh, everyone else on that on that team are good to have on your bench, but definitely not wanting to start them week to week at this point. Uh, then we have the Vikings at the Dolphins. You're starting all your Vikings. You're starting Kirk Cousins, Justin Jefferson, Dalvin Cook. Um, Adam Thielen is more of an if you must at this point. And uh, Irv Smith is is a trust just because uh, the tight end landscape is kind of brutal. Now, going up against the Vikings is the Miami Dolphins. They have uh, some some issues on the offense at this point. Uh, the rookie, Skylar Thompson, uh, started his first career game last week, and uh, it just was uh, a pretty brutal outing against the New York Jets. Um, so because of that downgrade at the quarterback position, um, you just want to temper your expectations for, for Jalen Waddell and Tyree Kill, although those are both still players I would still would feel obligated to have in my starting lineup, but uh, definitely just with some caution. So they're kind of a borderline trust, if you must, there. Um, Chase Edmonds, for me, is a bust at this point. Uh, really difficult to throw into a lineup after seeing his lack of usage last week, um, which is... Because of that, uh, I would be more likely to want to shift gears, look to uh, Raheem Mostert as an if you must. So obviously he was very productive, um, but I think just that that quarterback change just kind of brings the whole expectations for that offense down. So just be a little bit weary either way. Um, Mike Kosicki, just another one of my favorite tight end players, but just kind of brutal uh in the fantasy realm so he would be a bust as well definitely hold on to him you know see, see what happens see if bridgewater can play and and hopefully Tua eventually um but yeah just kind of kind of shaky there then we got the cincinnati Bengals at the new orleans saints uh joe burrow does come back home here to uh, new orleans so that should be interesting i'm starting all my Bengals as long as they're healthy uh joe burrow t higgins jamar chase Joe Mixon. Uh, what's interesting is if T. Higgins, who has been questionable this week, <clears throat> if he's ruled out, I think that does elevate Tyler Boyd and Hayden Hurst. So those are two guys to keep an eye out for. <clears throat> but I'd be very confident starting the Bengals there. Then on the Saints side of the ball, uh, still not sure if Jameis Winston is going to be healthy. All their starting wide receivers, Michael Thomas, Chris Alave, and Jarvis Landry have been very much questionable all week. No guarantee that they can play. So what's going to happen in this game, I still would be very confident starting um, Alvin Kamara. Then you know what? At tight end with Taysom Hill, sure. Why not? I, I think I could trust him at this point. Just It's just kind of a very unique offense. They're just going to do what they have to do and Taysom had this monster like ridiculous like three uh three touchdown game in week five I'm not going to expect that week in and week out but how he is being implemented in the offense is really intriguing enough that he is a little bit of a cheat code there at the tight end position uh just because it's been just kind of gross at, at that position this season I would be okay rolling with uh, Taysom Hill if I was able to snag him off of waivers or if I was already holding him in a deep dynasty league. Then we have the Ravens at the New York Giants. New York Giants, this is easy. I'm only really trusting Saquon Barkley. Even Daniel Jones is a borderline super flex play against the Ravens. The Ravens, I am trusting Lamar Jackson, obviously, and Mark Andrews. Um, 
J.K. Dobbins to me is 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 kind of a borderline trust if you must. Uh, I do like the matchup here for Dobbins, but um, did not get a ton of work against Cincinnati, so he may still be just kind of working his way back to a more of a full time role there. Uh, he was pretty efficient though with his carries. Uh, so, so, so you like to see that that's like step one. Now step two is, is efficiency with, with, with volume. So hopefully that, uh, that implementation can change here against the giants. Um, so I, I would most likely be starting Dobbins, uh, for sure. <clears throat> Anyone outside of those three would would kind of give me some hesitation like Devin Duvernay. He has been very good up to this point, but still just not getting a ton of volume, even though he has been uh, performing well. Uh, it had to be a very deep roster, very deep um, amount of flex plays in order for me to get Devin Duvernay in a starting lineup. And then just keep your eye on Rashad Bateman, see if he is going to be active. Uh, and whenever he is, that'll basically change uh, the uh, dynamics of the passing game, hopefully. Um, but I don't think we can count on him for week six. Then in the later uh, slate of Sunday games, we have the Carolina Panthers at the LA Rams. Really the, the only Panther I'm really going to trust at this point is Christian McCaffrey. Um, DJ Moore is officially, and if you must, there's a lot of moving parts to, to this Carolina team right now. Uh, head coach Matt rule has been fired. Uh, interim head coach is now in, um, and Baker Mayfield uh, has an injured foot. So Sam Darnold is on IR. I don't know. I don't think that Baker Mayfield is going to be playing in week six. And, uh, if that's the case then it's going to be uh PJ Walker or like Philip Walker, um, definitely a fun guy to root for, but it's, you can't, Ignore the fact that, you know, it is just not a non-regular starter um, who, I, I mean, he has started in the league, but um, that just kind of makes you weary for the whole offense as a whole. So really just CMC as a trust and even that's kind of shaky and DJ Moore as an if you must. The Ram side of the ball, uh, Cooper Cup and Tyler Higby are trusts. Um, Stafford and Akers to me and, and Cam Akers are if you must. And then Bus are Allen Robinson and Daryl Henderson. Fine holding them on my bench uh, on my bench, but definitely not in any rush to get them in a starting lineup. And to be perfectly honest, uh Cam Akers is is a borderline if you must option. Um it could just be uh kind of a juicy matchup against the Panthers because they just are not very good. They are just in shambles right now. Next matchup is the Arizona Cardinals at the Seattle Seahawks. Um, on the Cardinals side of the ball, uh, I'm starting Zach Ertz as a trust. Uh, James Conner, uh, he's kind of dealing with a, a rib injury. He should be good to go. Uh, but as we said earlier in the start sick question, I think uh, this is kind of an interesting spot for Eno Benjamin just because the Seattle Seahawks defense is just that bad against running backs. Um, Marquise Brown, I'm starting, and Kyler Murray, I'm starting. Uh, on the Seahawks side of the ball, Geno Smith, I'd feel comfortable starting even uh, in, in single QB leagues, but but especially as a super flex. Uh, the wide receivers, DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett, absolutely. And then Kenneth Walker, uh, for sure. I'd be uh, very happy to fire up against the Cardinals outside of those core four, not starting any other Seahawks. <clears throat> Then uh, a very interesting game here, uh, the Buffalo Bills at the Kansas City Chiefs. I think you have a pretty clear set of trust uh, candidates here. That would be Josh Allen on the Bills and Patrick Mahomes on the Chiefs. Uh, the Chiefs tight end, Travis Kelsey, wide receivers on the Bills, Stefan Diggs and Gabe Davis are trust options. Uh, the if you must options would basically include all the running backs here. So Devin Singletary, Clyde Edwards, Hilaire, they are if you must. And then they just want to mention uh, Juju Smith Schuster as an if you must as well. I think this game could um, be a blowout. It could have a lot of points. So I think Juju is pretty interesting here, uh, who has been averaging um, essentially eight targets a game, with, with the exception of the week two uh, three target outing. But that, that's pr that's pretty much an outlier at this point. He hasn't done a ton with those targets yet this season, so he's been a little bit disappointing. But um, I think because of the scoring potential here, I think you can uh, potentially uh, consider him as a flex play. 
So that is going to wrap it up uh, for the week six uh, start sit show and matchup preview. Uh, thank you again for, for watching and listening. Again, if you have any more start sit questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me at, on Twitter at Fantasy Ladder or in the comment section on the video. And uh, please check out uh, Hoove at HooveTube on Twitter. He was a really fun guy and he'll be coming out with, with, with really good content uh, soon too. Uh, so make sure to give him a follow. Again, subscribe to the YouTube channel here at the IDP Guys Network. And I will be uh, linking the GoFundMe uh for uh, the uh, the IDP guys uh, website editor uh, Faith, uh, who had her home destroyed from Hurricane Ian, I just want to keep that GoFundMe in there because a lot of her uh, personal belongings were uh, destroyed. Um, she's okay. She 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 didn't have to. She, she got out of the storm and everything else safely. But uh, the the uh, devastation is is pretty um, pretty. Uh, insane. So I will be linking that uh, down below as well. So if you are able to, please uh, help out with the GoFundMe. And um, just want to remind you about my partnership with BetUS. If um, you want to try out sports gambling, especially on BetUS, if you use a link that I can I can provide for you, if you deposit $100, they will give you a bonus $150 on top of it. So if you're interested in that, please do not hesitate to reach out. But that'll do it for this episode. Thank you for watching and uh, best of luck with everything. And uh, hopefully this, this episode was able to help you figure out the, the proper process to make the best lineup decisions possible. At the end of the day, this show is designed to help you with your lineup optimization week to week. So thank you for watching. Thank you for, for listening. And uh, please subscribe to the channel. Good luck and keep climbing.